Hello, and welcome to the next episode of the Customer Acquisition Show. I'm your host, Tom Meredith, the VP of Marketing and Innovation here at Tier 11. And I am joined by two of our amazing copywriters uh, who've both been here for well over, I think, two years at this point. Uh, we're, today, we'll be talking about all things copywriting, what converts, insights, advice, writing within an agency on multiple clients, um, all through this lens of really trying to help our clients do or get what they most want, and that is acquiring new customers. Welcome, Yusuf and Aaron. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, so uh, Tier 11 is a completely worldwide team. and I think this is one of our first times having somebody uh, from France here. Uh, Yusuf, welcome. And Aaron's coming from the south in Alabama. This is what an Alabamian looks like, just yeah. so that the world knows. <laughs> Well, great. So uh, how did everybody uh, do on their uh, Black Friday uh, creative? Everything, find, anything, find anything that worked? I would say it was intense, but uh, we had a lot of winners. And for actually not all of the campaign, but almost all of the campaign, we had a really good performance for, uh, you know, all the accounts that had the BFCM uh, promo. So, yeah, it was a pretty good one, but it was intense. Yeah, as every year, right? It's pretty probably pretty interesting. I mean, it's Black Friday, Cyber Monday, so the, the uh, need for persuasive copywriting is probably down a little bit. But yeah. Yusuf, you you bring like a really interesting perspective because you you're making the transition from copywriter to media buyer. Like, how's that uh, working for you, and how are you thinking about that? Yeah, I think it's uh, you know having a background in copywriting is extremely helpful in media buying. Because we're moving into, um, you know, into a world where you cannot rely on media buying tactics without having a good copy, a good ad and a good offer. Like, you know, three, four, maybe five years ago, you can say pretty much anything on Facebook and you will make some sales and maybe you will be profitable. But today, especially after iOS 14, well, basically you need good persuasive copy and strong creative strategy to be able to produce results for uh, for your clients or for yourself. So, so yeah, the transition uh, from copy to media buying is an interesting one. And I'm finding that uh, my background, this copy is helping me a lot to, like you can tell right off the bat, which copy will perform, which ad will do well and which will not do as well. So, so yeah, like it's really helpful. Yeah, so you talked quite a bit about like having this persuasive copywriting background. I, I think you guys are both pretty traditional and where you come from and like your training coming up through more traditional like sales copy. Uh, talk a little bit about like where you've learned from and how you think about your approach to writing persuasive copy for not just Facebook ads, but I think you guys are both writing copy across the conversion architecture division as well. Do you want to go ahead, Darren? Go ahead, Yusuf. I'll follow yeah. up, brother. Yeah, so, so writing persuasive copy on Facebook can be quite uh, frustrating at the beginning, and I'm going to tell you why. When you write copy, you have this tendency to use the word you a lot and call out personal attri attributes and whatnot. So when the, the first time you start writing ad copy, it can be a little bit frustrating because, because you can do none of that because Facebook will not approve your ads, right? So you got to find kind of other ways to communicate your message and still be persuasive without uh, calling out personal attributes, without using, overusing, I would say, the word you. So, uh, so yeah, that's the one kind of specific, one thing that is specific to, to Facebook ads. Yeah, so... <clears throat> To the point of uh, personal attributes and you and Facebook ad copy, uh, you do have to be careful. You can use the word you, but it has to be in a positive light. So uh, I, I'm, I have the uh, tendency to say that in the world of Facebook land, it's like Disney World. Nobody gets to be unhappy in Disney World. Right. And so if there is uh, a personal attribute that shines negatively on the reader, yeah, it's going to get banned every time. But if you use the word you in a positive light where it is less um, 
negative or it's, it's spin in the positive light. You can get away with using the word you if you, do, if you know how, if you know what you're doing. So um, personal attributes uh, being what they are, the word you being the single most powerful word in the human language outside of one's name, right? Uh, or a potential uh, title. So um, you definitely, you can do it. You just have to be very, very careful of it. And we have a, a great YouTube short out there of our very own Aaron Crocker talking to Aaron Crocker about getting Facebook ads rejected for the improper use of you, uh, which we'll drop the link to that in the uh, description below. Uh, so I, I think <laughs> Facebook ad policy, I don't see anybody run up against it more than uh, traditional copywriters making the switch yeah. to Facebook ads. So you talked a little bit about um, personal attributes. Like, what are some of the other major mindset shifts you make coming over from a world where you don't need to meet Facebook ad policy? Yeah, so I think the first thing to be aware of is to identify and actually know what is the most important part of your ad copy. Like in, tr in a traditional, you know, uh, sales copy, that would be the headline, right? If you had $1 to spend, 80% of that dollar will go to the headline. Well, in, uh, in Facebook ads, it's not the headline that comes, you know, on the image or the creative. It's another thing. The most important part of that, uh, of that ad copy is the copy that comes above the fold. You see there are two or three sentences, then you click see more. Those two or three sentences are actually the most important part of your ad copy. And I'm going to tell you why. Because if you say the right thing in those two or three sentences, you will get people to click and therefore read the rest of your ad copy and click to, you know, to go to your landing page uh, and, you know, potentially buy from you. But if you mess up in those uh, two or three sentences, that above the fold a copy or hook, whatever you want to name it, then it's game over. You lost them. And one of the biggest mistakes I see people making, which is an instant turn off, is that using acronyms and big words in that above the fold copy. Because if I read that and I don't understand what you're talking about, I'm scrolling away because that's what I was doing anyway. So I think that's something to be mindful of and to pay a lot of attention to. The above the fold copy is the most important part of your ad copy, so you gotta you gotta give it a lot of thought, and uh, and yeah, if you're gonna spend an hour writing an ad copy, spend the first thirty minutes coming up with hooks and above the fold copy that will actually, uh, you know, resonate with your target audience. Because if you miss the mark there, it's game over. Yeah, and that's because <laughs> Facebook is an interruptive environment right and exactly this is why the creative has to stop the scroll creative really really is king of the hill here right so it's gotta it's gotta stop the scroll so that anybody it would be interested in in reading those first couple of lines it's funny how you describe yeah. like the ad copy you know me being a video guy i think of like the creative side and like oh you, you, there's different blocks that we can mess around with to test like that's really the, like, if we were to iterate on the scroll stopper of the video, that, that first three lines is like, you guys should, are just typically iterating on that, right? Because, you yeah. know, the, bo the body copy does the job of selling, yeah. but it's really like, how do you hook them to get in there? Exactly. And it's also the fastest way to do, to test multiple hooks because the body copy is the body copy, right? Like it's not going to change that much, hmm. uh, but where you can test is actually the above the fold copy, that's what you want to test. And I would say that it is very important to match the above the fold copy, your hook with your creative. So let's say you have um, some, an above the fold copy that's like a headline, your tagline on the image or on the video should be the same. So you can do a test that is actually meaningful. How do you match that up with this like um, narrative going through like just advertising in general, where give the machines the control, you would dump your creative in, your copy in, your headline in, and you let it mash it all together to find the right person. Uh, well, in Facebook, it's a little bit different, right? Because, well, depending on like what account you're working on, how long you've been working on it, because you can have a lot of data that you can use and leverage. 
you don't want to reinvent the wheel, right? So if you have stuff that's proven to work, you're just going to use that and iterate from it. But generally speaking, I would say, like the way I like to do it, I come up with five or 10 hooks, right? And so I have my hooks, and then you add the ad copy right underneath them, right? So what I'm really testing is the hooks. Once I found, I find like two, three, five, whatever hooks that works really well, I write specific copy for those specific hooks. And that's how you get, how you kind of test, uh, test your copy and everything. And it's really like a creative um, flywheel, right? Where you're getting information from the visual creative team. They're getting information from you, like what's working, what's not. And then you, know, you kind of iterate on that. They iterate on what you're doing. It's kind of like this supporting each other to always find the best uh, combination overall. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. And it's, it's the way to go, especially in 2022, we're going into 2023. Like, as I said, creative testing and copywriting and all that is the key to, to win on Facebook as an advertiser, which to be honest with you, like you didn't have to do all this work maybe five years ago. Like most agencies didn't have copywriters. They had, you know, the media buy writing the copy and it was working fine. But, you know, with customers becoming more sophisticated and with uh, Pixel being pretty much not what it used to be, you need a team of creative people to, you know, who do this full time to be able to produce the, res the results you're going after. Yeah. And we, we saw how things were going with the, the need for higher sophistication and ad copy. And that's kind of how we started to form this, the copy team here at Tier 11, getting really... Um, a lot more persuasive, like deep research, old school copywriters. And, yeah. it's, you know, it, it's all, it's, you know, it's been an you know, interesting journey and sometimes the speed is not quite there, but the thought process and thinking is really top notch. Um, so you talked about like working with like the visual creative, like, do you prefer to have the visual creative first or do you like to start copy first? Uh, it depends, right? Like if we have, uh, you know, creatives when, that are that have been proven to work, that we're gonna create copy that matches those creative. But if you know we have kind of copy that's proven to work with a creative that doesn't really match the copy, then we'll take the copy and create creative that mm -hmm. matches the copy. So it depends which one came first, right? Right. <laughs> the chicken or the copy? Yeah, or exactly. The copy or the egg? Yeah, which one came first? <laughs> So, uh, Yusuf, let me um, bump in here. Uh, you and I haven't had a chance to speak in quite a while, so uh, I'm going to pick your brain here just a bit. Now that you're moving over into the Facebook world from the copy side, you're giving yourself an advantage that's uncommon to most copywriters, right? You get to see the analytics real quick, right? It's yeah. one of the great frustrations of copywriters is that we don't see how quickly or if our copy is working at all. You have a that you now are earning that advantage by going into um, media buying. Are you, are you in mostly Facebook at the moment? Yeah, mostly Facebook. Okay. So with Facebook then, um, and this is a bit of a side, you uh, know, rabbit trail. So just pull me back in, but uh, how are you finding copy different from an e-commerce versus say like a coaching uh, company? And how do you then adjust your copy when it comes to uh, a level one client versus say a level three or four client? Yeah, so to answer your question about the difference between e-commerce and let's say an info product business. So e-commerce like used to be this very short copy, headline, three bullet points, call to action and that's it, which is fine. However, like I have friends that run e-commerce stores and like the best ads are the res are the ads that you know have in copy that's in direct response style like a story based copy or something that you know more direct response in style that's what's working best so like right now we're moving into a world where even e-commerce people are starting to write copy that looks more like uh, direct response traditional copy so that's for the first part of the question. What was the second part, Aaron? Yeah, just to, how are you adjusting your length of copy uh, yeah. based on level one, say, to level three, four, five? Yeah, so level one tends to be longer 
because I like to do story story ads, right? And the reason for that is twofold. Like the first reason is because you know it's a way to bypass all of the personal attribute stuff and the you stuff. Like if I'm saying negative story about myself, Facebook like right. can't say anything because I'm talking about myself. It's my story, right? right? So right. that's kind of a trick <laughs> or a hack, if you will, to to bypass those policies in an ethical way. So that's the first reason. And the second reason is because stories uh, work very well. They're very persuasive. You cannot argue a story. It's my story. You cannot say I'm right or wrong. It's a story. So it's the right. most persuasive. Uh, it's the most persuasive form of copy. And in terms of length, yeah, as I said, for level one, so cold traffic tends to be uh, on the long side of the spectrum, right? I would say medium to long, depending on the account. And... Uh, the more you move down the funnel, the shorter the copy will become because you, it doesn't need to be as, pers as persuasive as uh, level one copy. But yeah, level one is the longest, I would say. So you, you talked a little bit about levels. Like, Can you kind of hit on the different levels of awareness and just get a brief definition of like the ones that you're, you're moving them through? Yeah, so the level of awareness, if we're referring to Eugene Schwartz's level of awareness, the one that I focus on are problem-aware people and, uh, and solution-aware. Like, I don't talk to someone who's unaware or someone, you know, like, and the most, I would say, the biggest segment I like to focus on is problem-aware people. I don't like to focus on solution-aware. So, for example, if uh, you open your ad with, here is how our product is better, or here is how our product is different, or whatever, or maybe you're opening with the mechanism behind your product or offer, what you're actually doing is that you're talking and attracting um, solution-aware people. What will happen then is that those people First of all, it's not the biggest segment of the market. That's the first thing. So you don't, you will not have a lot of scale. That's one thing. And the second thing is that they will compare you to other solutions. Because if you attracted people who know a solution, they will compare you to the other solution that they have tried or that they've read about or whatever. Whereas when you're, when, when you're talking to people who are problem aware, they do not necessarily know any solution. So when you present your solution, even though it's not the only solution, it seems like the only solution for them. So your ads will work better and you will have also a much more scale. Yeah. So Go ahead. Let, me, let me echo on this a little bit, Tom, if you don't mind. <laughs> so I yeah. find it interesting, uh, you said that you and I come at this slightly from a different angle. Um, you say you don't like to talk to the unaware, the level one client, and yet um, I have to make the assumption that everybody's unaware, right? Even if they are aware of, you know, needing, you know, uh, skills and helping to write, uh, let's use copywriting, for example, they, they want to buy a copywriting course, right? Or they're looking for a copywriting solution. Uh, you still have to assume that they are beginners, that they don't know any, I can't make any assumption in my copy that they already know who we are, what we're about and what our story is. Right. And so I was having this conversation with Tom a couple of days ago that, look, I mean, even at the level two, three, and sometimes even level four people, they will forget your story because they have their own story. They're worried about themselves. It's all about me, myself and I. Right. And uh, so when you re-enter their life, they would have long since forgot you. If you've ever watched a movie and went back and rewatched it and go, I don't remember half of this, this is proof positive that they're not going to remember who you are, right? So um, I almost always write from, they don't know me, they don't know who I am, they don't know anything about me, or they've forgotten me, or they don't care, right? And so I always start as an unaware launch for me. So... Um, <clears throat> But I can be course corrected and uh, walked off the ledge there. But uh, just walk me through your your philosophy of starting at the problem aware versus unaware. Yeah. So like when we talk about so so there are two concepts, right? They, there is the Eugene Schwartz levels of awareness, and there is the um, the levels of traffic that we have at tier eleven, right? And to me, they are quite similar, but they have, you know, uh, points on which they are quite different. 
So when we say level one traffic, this is a person that can be problem aware or solution aware or that's unaware. True. That's right. You know, like they are problem aware, but we call them uh, level one because we have never advertised to, the, to these people before. They have never engaged with us. So to us, they are level one traffic. But to right. the market and the market they're in, they're not level one traffic. Right. You know what I mean? So that's what I mean. But uh, by doing like when I write my copy, I write it to problem aware first, then I do the other ones. I'm not saying do not focus on the other segments. You absolutely should for the people watching us. Like you absolutely should write to all the segments. But the biggest segment, in my opinion and in my experience, that will give you the biggest scale is the people who are problem aware. That's where you will find most of the people. When you go look, like if you look at uh, search volume for keywords on Google, you will notice that people who are looking for keywords that are uh, problem oriented is way bigger than people who are looking for, for the solution for that problem. You know yeah. what I mean? So let's push back a little bit. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> Lynn Swayze will agree with you completely. Right. There's no such thing as a problem or uh, unaware client. It's, we're just too inundated with information nowadays to be unaware. Right. But um, you've also uh, admitted that the greatest copywriting force is story based and story based is almost exclusively level one. Right. So walk me through how your story based email or a Facebook copy isn't also deeply unaware, right? Because you're, you're using a story to generate longer copy to persuade who? Those who are probably unaware of your solution. They may be problem aware to your point, right? Uh, and they may even be solution aware, but do you dare assume that they know anything about you and do you not assume that they're level one to us for sure, right? Um, go ahead. Oh, they don't. I know they don't. But uh, like at that point in the funnel, people do not care about me, my story, my right. offer, whatever. They just will resonate with something that actually resonates with them because I'm talking about a pain point that they have, a desire that they have, et cetera, through my story. Right. So at that point in the funnel, they do not care. And I know that they do not care. Right. So like when we say unaware, like if we're referring to Eugene Schwartz again, like like they're unaware of nothing, unaware of solution, unaware of problem. They're completely unaware. Right. Yeah. Like uh, unaware for us, at least at tier 11, level one, as I said, is people who we have not advertised to. Which means, uh, you know, like in Facebook, you can exclude people and your level one, you're excluding your past customers, et cetera, right? So these are truly people who have never seen your message. They know nothing about you, et cetera. So, yeah, I'm in the camp with uh, Yusuf and Lynn where in the world that we live in, especially on Facebook, people are not unaware. I mean, most likely, they will have seen something else reading the blog post or anything else that's made them aware of the problem. And I, I think that story copy does work at the problem aware level. I, I mean, that you're really creating copy that they can empathize with, right? Like right. I have a problem. This story has a problem. Hopefully somebody has a solution. Goes right back to my argument earlier that even at levels two, three, and four at times, people will forget your story and therefore a story works. That's, that's just the point, right? Um, but let's now uh, talk about the greatest mover and all of direct response, and that is the cold traffic. That is the people that don't know anything about you. If you can tap into cold traffic, you can write your own ticket, right? So then if that's the case, if that holds, uh, that premise holds then why ignore, why ignore level one in your copy? I think we're mixing things up a little bit here. Like if we're talking about awareness, is. awareness levels, I would say cold traffic is really anything that's not product aware, right? Because they don't know you. 
So this is the problem with, the, and this is something that Ralph uh, Burns and I have talked about at length at times, and that is Eugene Schwartz's five levels of awareness. They, they only fit nicely in their own box on paper. But in real life, they're just intermeshed, right? And they'll move in and out of awareness states. Um, and, and they just do not fit nicely as, you know, we would like them to fit. So um, uh, that just to say that um, humans are incredibly complex and emotional and, you know, they just, they're all over the, all over the board when it comes to uh, their awareness levels. Well, I think that's something that's really uh, at least on the video side, you can take somebody through all these or hit all these different awareness levels in a single video. Same thing with the story, story copy, right? Like yeah. you yeah. don't do yeah. specifically problem aware copy. It's like problem aware. Then you're making them solution aware. And since it's a Facebook ad and this is direct response and people have some expectation of a return on their ad dollar, you're probably making them product aware as well. And right. you want to, most likely there's a CTA that drives scarcity, right? So like, uh, that's most aware. So it's like really all these things go together in a single ad. It's just how you think about that. Yeah. So let's, let's move off of Facebook for a moment and go to the most expensive way to advertise on the planet. That's direct mail, right? If you're going to do direct mail, you are paying <laughs> crazy amounts of money to run a test, right? So do you dare then go into that environment and not tell the whole story? which means you have to assume even if you've got a past customer who has bought a supplement from you, do you dare send that a new supplement package to that client with the assumption that they know anything about your company? Let me answer that for you. The answer is no, right? You start from level one cold traffic and you build them, you build their awareness throughout the copy. Now it takes a lot of copy to do that, right? But um, to extrapolate that idea back into the world of Facebook, um, you know, this is why for me, this is my philosophy. Everybody's cold. Everybody's level one. I don't care if you've bought from me before. I assume that you don't know anything about me and therefore I must rebuild brand awareness and relationship to get you to make the next purchase. That's just yeah. where I'll operate from. Yeah, solution aware, product aware. And unaware. I have no. to assume you don't know anything about me. That's right? not that's not what unaware is. Unaware is you don't know you have a problem. Well, it, it's it's where it, it is true that you don't have a problem. Uh that you unaware that you don't have a problem. That's correct. And so you have to introduce a problem, right? Yeah. So for example, I'm writing one for a a uh a company right now that we have that is um, uh, in the copywriting space. So my very first sentence in my very first ad says, if somewhere deep inside you'd like to fire your boss and stay home and write for a living, right? That's sentence one broken, right? So what's that, what's that do? That, uh, that, um, Hints to a person, you know, I would like to write for a living, right? That's the solution. It's also, they don't know they have a problem. They, they, they have a, an idea that they would like to change careers. And so we go and we stir up that hornet's nest, right? Yeah. And so we, um, and, and, you know, it, it does, you know, it doesn't fit nicely in anything as we said before, but to um, to go into a, a, disru uh, a disruptive media like Facebook, we want to introduce to those guys, the reader, we're interrupting them, that there may be a way to start writing for a living. And they may have never even considered it. Right. Okay. Well, let's uh, move on to a bit more of like the ins and outs of like the day-to-day -day of writing for multiple clients, like how do you sustain that? And how do you get deep across multiple clients, write good persuasive copy, do it fast, and then iterate quickly? Go. Yeah, well, to me, I try to write in the same day for the same client. Right. 
right? So that's kind of the ideal scenario. But sometimes you cannot do that because, you know, tight deadlines and whatnot. So what I try to do is to uh, write or put all the same, the clients that are in the same niche in the same day. Mm -hmm. So let's say we have three supplement clients. I do them all in the same day, right? Especially if they have similar products or whatever, because, you know, it keeps you on your zone of genius instead of hopping from here to there. Like now you're writing about jewelry, now you're selling coaching, now you're talking about whatever. So it makes it a little bit hard. So that's how I, um, I keep it, you know, simple and easy for me and how, because in my opinion, the biggest things that kill your productivity as a copywriter is to switch uh, too often. Like every two hours you're writing something new on a new niche, new topic. And that kills your productivity, in my opinion. Like it takes, I think there is some scientific study about this. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it's like when you switch from think to think, it takes your brain 30 minutes or so to kind of readapt and get into the flow. So I try to keep all for one client one day. And when you have multiple clients, which I always do, I put all the clients of the same niche in the, the same day when it's possible. Sometimes it's not. So you have to kind of um, finish all the work for one specific client before moving to the next. So that way you can completely unplug your brain from that first client and focus on the next. You know, talk a little bit like your process, like prepping before copy. I mean, cause writing's part of it, but as all of the copywriters I've ever talked to, like copywriting is 90% research, right? How do you yeah. prep for copywriting? Even if you're batching it across multiple similar clients? Yeah, well, it depends if it's an existing client and I'm already familiar with their, you know, their market, their product, etc. Like I go right at it. I take the best performing copy or whatever. We try to iterate from that. We test new angles. So there is not a lot of research, I would say, involved in writing for an existing accounts that I'm actively uh, writing for. But if it's a new client, you know, at tier 11, we have the deep dive research right that we do when we onboard a client which as uh, its name says it's a really deep dive research where we uncover the pain points desires etc of the market which makes the job of the copywriter easier it makes the job of the creative uh, team easier it makes everybody's work easier right so so that's what i look at and i also like to look at what the competitive what the competition is doing and the ads library just to get some inspiration, et cetera. And, uh, and yeah, then you just start writing. And in terms of process, as I said earlier, I start with the hooks. Two, three, five, ten hooks, depends, right? And then I plug in the, the body copy. And I, you know, uh, tweak it a little bit because sometimes the transition from one hook to a body copy is fine, but for the next hook, it can be a little bit odd. So you need to tweak it a little bit to make it uh, transition smoothly. Yeah, that's that's pretty much my process for writing copy, ad copy. How about you, Aaron? What's your process? <clears throat> Same thing. I mean, it all starts with research for me. I ascribe to the, uh, the classic uh, copywriting uh, genius um, that says, you know, yeah, the creativity doesn't come from within. It comes from without, right? And so um, I, I search out everything. I find out who's saying what and um, operate from a premise that the voice of customer is king of the hill. And if the, if the customers are talking about it, then um, we should be using it in our copy. And that just comes from the research. And that can be found in a variety of ways from, uh, doing research on Amazon reviews all the way down to forum uh, or Reddit uh, forums and uh, a plug-in that you can get for Chrome. Um, that's called, let me see if I've got that right here for this. Um, Google discussion. Yeah. 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 And uh, which allows um, you to find the, um, the forums where people are talking in real language. It's, it's the fastest way to get copy done, voice of customer. 
So you said that it was called Google Discussion. It's a Chrome extension. I think this is, starts a great topic of what are all the copywriting secrets, tools, tricks, hacks? I mean, I know copywriting is fundamentally like a, a, a very thoughtful, deep process, but all experts have their secrets. What are yours? Yeah, so as Aaron mentioned, Google Discussion is definitely one of them because instead of, you know, spending crazy amount of time trying to found the forums it just takes you directly to the forums so you look at the discussions reddit is definitely one of the the website that i that i check out regularly amazon reviews so underutilized in my opinion uh there is also a tool called let me find the name of it ad finder so what so it's a Google Chrome uh, extension or plugin, however you want to call it. And what it does is that when you log in into your Facebook, it removes, well, it doesn't remove them technically. It hides everything that's not an advert from your feed. Huh. For the normal person, or as John Carlton would call them, civilians, that's a nightmare, right? But as marketers, <laughs> that's like a dream. So you're just scrolling, and the only thing you see is ads, right? So, and the way to get it to work and to see to be able to see ads for you know a given niche you just visit a couple of websites for that specific niche and you will start seeing ads for those so yeah. that's a great way to oh, what was that to only see ads in your advert ad finder ad finder yeah like the opposite of ad blockers right and yeah exactly <laughs> Yeah, yeah, when I talk to people when, you know, I'm having issues installing some software or something, they're like, do you use ad blocker? I was like, I'm like, dude, that's the last thing I would want to do. What you talking about? <laughs> nice. How about you, Aaron? Any uh, tricks, secret hacks? You know, if you're in Facebook groups, those are gold, right? And uh, especially if you're in a Facebook group that is in the niche that you're writing for, which is all that really matters. And then going and find out what frustrates um, people is just, um, it's just critical uh, stuff. Um, when it comes to ad um, swipes and things like that, the real, there's both a benefit and a threat here. One of which is, how do you know if it's working? If it's if you don't know that it's working, you go to swipe the wrong thing. You'll be just swiping bad ads. So uh, the real trick is to find something that seems to constantly show up in your newsfeed for you know periods of time where they're either idiots spending lots of money or they uh, have actually dialed it into where they know what they're doing and and then you can uh, better um, craft a, a message around what's working. Yeah, and I think Facebook ad library is really powerful here. It doesn't necessarily tell you the exact performance, but the way I th assume, I think about it and assume is like the older an ad is, because it tells you in the timeline, the more likely it is to be a successful right. ad or a very bad media buyer who doesn't turn off things that aren't working. And then if you start to see a lot of themes reoccurring within an ad library, whether it's visual or in the copy, that's most likely something that they've found to be successful. Yeah. And also being in, in Facebook forums where it's just lively, lively, lively. Like one of those is nothing held back, right? Alan Sultanic's nothing held back community is uh, a tremendous resource for gaining um, <clears throat> what's working uh, now. Uh, yeah, talking about communities, like where are some, if people are aspiring copywriters or really want to stay up on what the latest copywriting trends are, are there any like, groups that you guys are in or suggest for people to join? Uh, not specific to copywriting, honestly, because um, I've been moving kind of more towards being, you know, a mix of everything. So a full stack marketer, so to speak, but nothing held back, as Aaron mentioned, is probably the best Facebook group currently for marketers and business owners in general. Well, let's not forget Copy Chief with Kevin Rogers now. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, but they don't have a Facebook group, unfortunately. Well, they do, but it's paid, right? You oh, really? You can't actually, oh, okay. Right? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's only the, for those who are a part of the uh, Copy Chief paid community. It's, yeah, so I didn't know there was a Facebook group. 
Yeah. Yeah. For copywriting, Coffee Chief is hands down the best community, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. And they have training as well, right? Yeah, they have a whole bunch of training on on everything, right? Facebook ads, email, research, long form copy, everything you need. Freelancing, there is pretty much everything. Yeah, yeah. Much. I think we. And Kevin is a great dude too. So. Yeah. yeah, I know they've they've hooked us up with a couple of our copywriters over time, and yeah. yeah. So, uh, and while we're at it, we might as well mention copy hackers, right? And um, Joanna Weeby, if you're looking to get solid, solid copywriting training, hard to beat her. So are uh, copywriters I know, competitive with each other? I know, I think all of us like direct response marketers are competitive people and just you know want to win. But how about with each other? Well, the, the classical direct response world is cutthroat. Right. <clears throat> Let's go back to direct mail. You got uh, you got a, a control out there and a control for those listening who don't understand what it is. A control is a piece that's been unbeatable. Right. And it's sustained. It's um, king of the hill position for a while. Well, they'll go out and hire other copywriters to come in and try to beat it. Right. And sometimes a copywriter will go in and beat the control by doing nothing more than changing the headline and everything else stays the same. Right. And then suddenly who gets the royalties? the guy who made the last adjustment. And so it's a constant and perpetual, you know, cutthroat environment in that regard. Uh, but then when it comes to copywriting communities, um, you know, people are just pulling for everybody. The, the thing that I love about Terry Levin's environment is, and I've said this in the past, it's, it's the CrossFit version of digital marketing, right? There's no egos here. Everybody's pulling for everybody and everybody wants everybody else to win and everybody will bolster everybody up to help, help them win. So if you're on the same team, it certainly helps to, um, helps to be, um, have that spirit of, uh, spree to core. Right. But if you're in opposite agencies, obviously you're trying to, trying to win. It's a competitive environment. I guess uh, talk a little bit about being agency versus freelance and, I, I always found it better when I was like part of a team and other people I could bounce ideas off of, but there's, you know, freedom to being freelance too. Like if you're a freelance copywriter, how do you know you're doing good work or improving? Yusuf, you want to speak to that? Yeah. Well, it ties back to what Aaron said at the beginning of this, uh, of this live and that is numbers, right? You live for the numbers, like the numbers will right. tell you, but Again, like in a specific context, your copy may or may not perform. So you take the best control that has ever existed in history, right? Whatever it is, right? You mail it again today, it's not going to win, you know? So like I would say that to know, to first know if your copy is doing good or not, it... You got to work on a good offer, a good client, a good market. The timing has to be right, et cetera, et cetera. Like go sell a crypto offer right now compared to selling it two years ago. Like you, your copy can be amazing, but if the timing is right, it's going to bump. Right. You know what I mean? So you got to be very careful if you're a freelancer about choosing the right market, the right client, the right offer, the right timing, et cetera. Like... I don't, I'm not sure who said this. I think it was Gary Halbert, but it was something along the lines of like, you know, like the lesson is to go after the, at least don't go after the hardest market or the hardest offer or whatever, like make it easier for yourself. Yeah. Clayton Makepeace, uh, bless his heart, who he, is he now passed, made the comment one time that when you do um, an advertisement, the right mail piece, here's what you're hoping for. You're hoping that uh, the uh, there's no towers coming down, right? There's no major news breaks, right? But you hope that it's raining and the power is out and they, they've got nothing to do but sit at home and read your direct mail piece. <laughs> <laughs> so now, the, the online world is so challenging because it's the scroll environment, right? It's a scroll economy nowadays, scroll, scroll, scroll. And so getting that initial stop, that initial scroll stop, that's where the creative is so vitally important. And um, 
so it's um it's just difficult to um to get someone to buy in if you can't get them to stop right that's all i'm saying so Yusuf, you you kind of brought up this idea that um like uh, i'm not how i'm gonna say this basically like, i think you mentioned crypto offers like right they're dead like how are you guys thinking about are you, are you shifting your general copywriting for like where we are economically in this like economic cycle it seems like maybe there's a recession on the horizon has that started to creep its way in or change how you're communicating with people? Oh, absolutely. When there are, you know, those ec economical downturns or major events, you want to leverage that in your copy as much as you can, especially in ad copy, because it's usually not, you know, it doesn't take too long to produce, you know, it's not a sales page, so it shouldn't take you very long, but you want to leverage uh, those events as much as you can because it's top of mind. So people will connect with you, uh, instantly right like for example you talk about recession there was um when queen elizabeth passed away we used that right like for the uk audiences like you want to use that as much as you can but the thing is you got to be very quick about it <laughs> because yeah. you know the the word is moving very fast so what's today an event if it takes you two weeks to produce your copy, well, it's not an event anymore. There is something else. Mm -hmm. So it's not relevant. So you got to be very fast with it. But yeah, you want to use it as much as you can. And how, how, how do you think about like balancing that like fast turnover, um, like more trending copy versus like evergreen copy that you hope will last a couple months? Yeah, well... Is there a copy that lasts four months on Facebook? I'm not sure. <laughs> well, yeah, ad it... fatigue. Ad fatigue is a real thing on Facebook. Yeah. This is why a lot of people, you know, love Google because it gives you more stability long term. Whereas Facebook, you are constantly, uh, no matter how good your copy is and how good your creative is, eventually people will get tired of it and I've seen your ad, so you need to refresh it. But to answer your question, uh, like, so evergreen copy is there. Like, y y hopefully you're not doing it every week. Like one ad, maybe two, three, four, three weeks, right? Three months. It depends on the account, right? It depends on the niche. But uh, yeah, in terms of balancing, I guess I don't have a good answer. You just got to do it. <laughs> but yeah, like if you're writing for an event that's time sensitive, then you will prioritize that before you're the evergreen copy because the evergreen by definition is evergreen. So whether you produce it today or next week, it's not going to change anything because the goal is for it to be evergreen. Whereas um, when you're writing specifically to a given event, well, it's time sensitive, so you got to be quick. So it takes priority. Yeah, if it's going to be evergreen for any length of time, you've got to forget. You've got to keep in mind the things that will change and the things that will not change. And so, if you're writing to a topical event like Yusuf said, like you know the Queen passing, right? Well, that's guaranteed to be short-lived, right? Um, but if you write to the one thing that never changes, human nature. Now you have a much better opportunity for it to go evergreen, right? And so the universal approaches of you know, what people really want in life is going to get you a lot closer to an evergreen ad than a topical thing or a news breaking thing. Yeah. yeah. So we've so been talking about events is, is more to, to ride the wave, so to speak. Yeah. You're really right. just taking advantage of something that happened that you have no control over. You're just riding that wave to get, people attention really that's just where you would you because you're the you're in the game of getting attention right at the end of the day so you're using that topical event to just get attention and you're leveraging it so yeah and if you're thinking again in terms of levels whether it's awareness or traffic levels yeah. like that's probably a bit more of a the unaware and problem aware audiences right you want to get them into the funnel so that you can maybe hit them with a bit more evergreen copy that doesn't require as much topical or maybe it is topical depending on the scenario and the product. And if it, it can, you can drive scarcity with a specific event. Yeah, exactly. So Certainly. topical events copy tends to have a broader appeal 
Like you can attract people who have no interest in your product, in your offer, in whatever, right? Especially if, you know, you don't do a good job of transitioning from uh, or establishing the relationship between the event and your thing, your offer. Like if you do a bad job of establishing that relationship, you will attract a lot of people and, you know, people will say, oh, I have bad leads. I have, well, it's because of that, because you have attracted a lot of people that has nothing to do, that have nothing to do with your offer. So that's why. But if you do a good job at making that uh, relationship clear between the event and how it ties to, to your thing, then you should do well. Yeah. So level one. Yeah, level one. That's absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. So we've talked a lot about like ad copywriting and, you know, here that's only like part of the equation. Like we have, co there's copywriting all throughout this customer acquisition path, right? Yeah. Like talk a little bit about like after the click copywriting, what are you seeing working right now? Like e-commerce, should it be sent, send them directly to a, a product page? Should we be creating a bit more like landing page type, you know, copy? Yeah. So like before talking about what types of copy, et cetera, one thing that's super important and that can completely kill you the performance of your ads is ad scent. Or in other words, the congruency between what you're saying on your ad and the landing page. Mm -hmm. Like if you're talking about joint pain on your ad and the headline on the landing page is about blood pressure, well, it's a complete mismatch, yeah. right? So, and I see people, you know, making this mistake again and again and again. So you want to make your copy congruent with your landing page. And if you're going to be working with clients and you're, you know, you're testing an ad that's getting a lot of traction, right? Like a high CTR link, but people are not converting. You, you may want to ask your client to tweak their landing page to uh, match the ad because the ad is getting traction. So now let's work on the landing page and make it and make it uh, congruent with the ad. In terms of what's working for e-commerce, advertorials more and more for cold traffic because they're great to warm up the traffic and to also uh, get a higher quality leads, people who are more qualified, right? Because you're putting more hoops in your funnel. So if someone keeps jumping through through those hoops, Obviously, they're more qualified to buy. And um, as I said earlier, like the traditional e-commerce pages, they're, uh, you know, performing. They're not performing as well as they used to. So a lot of e-commerce brands are not good, are doing now advertorials or direct response style. Like it's literally a sales page selling uh you know, a physical product. Like they, they still have their Shopify store and everything, you know, product page, description, etc. But on top of that, they build direct response funnels for cold traffic acquisition. How about, uh, I know we have quite a few clients who are not e-commerce. Like what sort of stuff are you seeing going on over there? Info product? Yeah, info product, lead gen. Yeah, low ticket is uh, low ticket is doing well. Low ticket offers, so anything from three to twenty seven dollars, I would say, that's working really well as an acquisition as an acquisition funnel. But you know, it's got to be architected in a way that you're not losing money, or at least not a lot. Okay, some people are profitable with those offer if the funnel is uh, architected in the right way. Uh, in terms of lead gen, I mean, lead gen is lead gen, so it hasn't changed as much. Like, yeah, but um, for info product offers, low ticket is is the move, at least for now. Great. Well, we're kind of getting up here in an hour. Any other thoughts or topics you all wanted to hit on? Any let questions? Me just, um, let me... I feel like we're good. Yeah, take this opportunity to um, talk about one of the greatest mistakes that we see in, in the world of um, landing pages or um, checkout pages, right? Car page, uh, checkout pages, right? And so we get a lot of um, get a lot of bounce rates and abandoned carts. And why? What 
what's happening on the checkout page that is the missed opportunity. Well, the biggest one that I personally see, and I see it all the time, and I just saw it again today, right, is that they don't have testimonies on that checkout page, right? It's incredibly, it's just a big missed opportunity because consider this. In your Facebook ad, you have testimonies. And on your landing page, you have testimonies. But on your cart page, when it t- turns the time to pull out your credit card and make that big purchase, it's blatantly ab- uh, absent of the very thing that helped motivate get them there. So you definitely need testimonies on your checkout page. If you haven't tested it, you should test that. Oh yeah, the lack of proof on the checkout page is, is absolutely crazy, especially for e-com folks. No testimonials, no five-star reviews, no, uh, you know, the guarantee logo, nothing. Right. Yeah, it's, it's insane. For direct response folks, it's, they tend to do things well, but uh, for e-com folks, dude, <laughs> no proof. Like for some reason, they assume that people will remember the testimonial that you have put on your ad. Well, they will right. not. And That's even right. if they would, you know, remember it, why would you not put it? Why does it, what does it cost you to put it there? Nothing, but it can increase your conversion. So you might as well add it. Just imagine walking somebody from making them aware of their problem, showing them a, there's a solution, you yeah. know, giving them your product, getting them from the ad, to your landing page, getting them to take the action and then just hoping they'll like, not, yeah. not, you know, finalizing the, the deal with the uh, testimonials and proof. Yeah, dude. I mean, social proof on the checkout page is one of the biggest needle movers for sure. Yeah. Right. Well, I think that's a, a great tip to end it on. Uh, Yusuf and Aaron, thank you very much. I, I always enjoy these more, uh, these creative talks. Like I, I a creative guy myself and we can talk about this all day so i will definitely have you guys back um you know, a couple of call to actions here i'd say if you want, are a direct response copywriter looking for a great team to be a part of as yusuf mentioned bringing freelance can be a little tough if you aren't you know your clients come and go and maybe you don't have the right client when you're part of an agency you're part of you know a, a team that has new clients all the time so there's always lots of excellent work and big challenges and you could join these guys and uh, all the other great copywriters at tier 11. So I think that's tier 11.com slash careers. We're looking for copywriters. And then if you are a brand looking for um, an agency to really help walk your customers through this whole acquisition path and really hit all these different awareness levels that we've talked about and making sure that you have social proof on your checkout page, uh, head over to tier 11.com um, and you'll see a big old like work with us button and, you know, apply. And we'd love to talk with you and see if we could work together. Otherwise, thank you guys very much. Have a good weekend. And uh, I think we all have teams still in the world cup. So it's going to be a, a fun yeah. next, <laughs> next level. All right. Uh, good to see you again, Yusuf. Let's catch up, buddy. Good to see you, man. Okay. Thanks see guys. You. See ya.